it's a pleasure to be here with everybody. Uh, I appreciate the, the session chairs uh, and, and Peter for encouraging me to uh, submit an abstract and come here and, uh, and be here with you today. Uh, I was able to participate in the hackathon as well, which was a blast and uh, had a lot of fun doing that. So I'm going to go ahead and put up the agenda here. Um, so while you're reading that, um, I want to kind of introduce uh, what this is about. So the the big there, there's a big idea here that I want to introduce to everybody. Um, there's nothing new per se in what I'm doing in this in this project, but um, there's a, a, a kind of a combination of things that come together to 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 open up a lot of possibilities for what we could do with, uh, with data sets um, that are normally very difficult to do anything uh, data science-y with. Um, so, um, let me go. so the data that I'm going to be showing you today is from California in Kern County. Uh, I put some deep kind of background information about it. And what I hope that you'll kind of watch for as I talk here is, uh, one, this, this big idea that that's coming together, come together in this project. I, I went through uh, the, the previous talker had that uh, that creative thinking process where you're like, oh, it's awesome, and then it kind of goes to, oh, it sucks, and then oh, it's. I've kind of gone through that whole process with this, <laughs> and, and so I'm kind of back to, oh, it, it's awesome. It, it actually is really effective, and um, and it we're we're actually getting ready to kind of use this to help with our, especially our capital allocation of projects and things like that. So I put up here, you know, some of this should be pretty obvious if you're involved in any kind of asset development work in the oil industry. Um, but for those that aren't, uh, you know, these are the kind of goals of what you would be looking for in this type of project. Um, and the idea that I'm talking about here isn't just for, you know, in this case, we're looking at rate prediction, which, you know, I know that for some people that have gone to a lot of uh, data science talks like AAPG might to uh, give you the willies a little bit, but, uh, and also reserves prediction as well. But um, when, when people are doing that, these are kind of the things that they're going after with those types of projects. So um, this is not an all-inclusive menu here, but I, I just wanted to show some of the things that I, at least uh, I've looked at and been familiar with. Uh, when you're looking at these kind of uh, bypassed pay or new drill um, ranking or evaluation projects, um, you know, th these are the kind of systems you can look at. And, um, you know, obviously a lot of people go straight to the supervised system, but I'll show you why that can be kind of difficult here in a second. Uh, and then I'll also show you, you, you we talk a lot about transfer learning with uh, image problems, um, but we haven't really been able to do that with this type of data, these type of uh, completion data sets because there isn't a multi-million row related data set out there that you can train a model on and then transfer over. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of look at that. that. That's what I want to talk about today. So, um, and I'll show some more about this, but when you go to apply a traditional supervised learning approach, you kind of end up with the plot on the left here. Um, so what I'm showing here on this plot is there's this um, inferred oil metric that, that's kind of like showing um, if you took this ad pay completions neighbor well, like how much inflow performance it was getting per foot and just applied it to how much pay you're adding in this well. So whatever the nearest well was doing per foot, take the per foot you're adding in this one and apply it. Um, and then on the, the y-axis I have one of the features, and this is just, this is just an illustration of this, uh, is KH, so permeability height, so the sum of permeability that you've estimated in the well. Um, and you can see uh, we have the blue dots are all their past jobs that we've done. And the green dots are the, when you go through and crawl through the data that you have, all the available options today. Just kind of a garbage can bucket. This is everything you could do, right? Everything that's been flagged as pay, you could go at it. Um, and so what you see here is there's kind of a, a, a mismatch, right? Um, all the past jobs kind of sit over here in the upper right. And your available jobs have a little area of overlap in the middle, and then there's a huge area of available jobs where there's no job in the past that was like it for this feature, right? And what's driving that is bias, right? So when you go and you grab these past data sets of completions, there was some sort of rule 
system that a person used to select those jobs, right? And there is a reason why they selected those jobs, the blue dots, and not the, the green jobs, the, the green dots. Whatever that reason was, right or wrong, they had a reason, and so there's bias, right? Um, so, you know, part of why the, the, one of the ideas behind using a synthetic data set here is to kind of g get into the, those areas where there is no example in the past and try to create a reasonable value for that that you could train off of, right? To kind of fill in that space that you're missing. So, you know, on the right plot, I'm showing one of the runs of the synthetic model. There's some problems with it. You can see, like, on the high end, it's not covering things very well. But, um, but you can see it's, it's basically nuked the entire space of this feature, right? There's, there's points everywhere that it's covered. Um, and so it actually has the potential to not be as biased if you run a training model on it, right? So um, you can see some, some various things. There, there's more than just bias problems with, with using um, traditional supervised learning problems. So there's also some fundamental statistical problems, right? Um, very, it's very rare that you have a field with more than a few hundred examples of past completions, right? Um, and, and the statistics are pretty brutal when you don't have a very large data set. You, you, there's, it just limits what you can do. You can't go in and do a deep neural network model on 400 completions. It just won't work. And, and even if you do use an appropriate algorithm for traditional supervised learning, um, there's, you can't use very many features, right? Because if you add too many features, you're going to overfit to those features. Your, your feature space has no density, right? So you, you can't learn a useful generalizable model on more than one or two or three features on a 400-well data set. Um, so, you know, traditionally you have some options to try to address that in statistics. You know, you could go, hey, I'm going to go collect more data. When you're spending, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars per data point, that's not, maybe not so feasible. <laughs> um, maybe even millions if you're offshore. We, you know, at least in California, we're mostly, we're, we're mostly dealing with onshore stuff. But um, um, there's also, um, you know, just accept what you have and use what you can do. You know, that's, that's sometimes what people end up doing. Um, but I wanted to try something with the synthetic data approach. Uh, kind of a proxy, you know, you you've heard, may have heard, you know, proxy modeling. There's lots of different terms that could be applied to it, but um, to try to fill in the feature space, give it a little bit more density, and, and see if you can, uh, uh, you know, incorporate some kind of physics relationships into your data set. So there's a lot of routes you can take to do this. I've, I've seen some talks where people will go into, like, uh, an eclipse or, or some kind of, like, big simulator program, and they'll, They'll generate some examples using that. Um, but you're, it's going to take you a while to generate a big data set, and, and, and there's some issues with like creating the model. It can take a long time to create a model that would actually do well. Um, and I wanted something that I could deploy quickly across the company, right? You want, that's the, the dream, right? You want to something that you can build quickly in a pipeline sense, kind of have an automated component to it, and then it just is deployable quickly across your company. So to do that, you kind of have to keep it pretty lightweight. And so what I used is this Darcy inflow equation. Um, and basically what this is doing is defining what's important in your physics, right? So it's got KH in there, which is your permeability, which is kind of a fundamental property of the rock you're dealing with. It doesn't really change, per se. Uh, except in so far as that skin factor over there. So if you're damaging your reservoir with your drilling or fluids or anything like that, then it kind of gets rolled into that skin factor. It's got a little bit of something about drainage radius, which actually works out to not be super important for initial rates at least. Uh, and then you have pressure uh, and viscosity, things like that. Uh, what's really important though is that a lot of these things are features that you can kind of estimate in a lot of cases for your reservoir. Um, it does neglect a few operational things, which probably is a lot of the uncertainty that remains in the, in the results I'll show you here. But um, at least in so far as the, as, you know, what is my well going to do when I turn it on, th this governs a lot of the really important stuff. Um, so um, first off, this is, this, these plots kind of really show you what's going on with the supervised model in terms of overfitting and things like that. 
So I've got three plots here. On the left axis is that inferred oil um, metric that I've mentioned earlier, where you're kind of comparing the, bear, the inflow per foot on your offset well at the time you did the completion. And then on the x-axis, I actually have the actual results, or, or in the case of the machine learning colored dots, it's the, the predicted. So the green dots are the actuals. Um, so these are the actual pass completions uh, against this feature to our model, which was the, the offset well uh, performance. Um, so you can see it's got a nice kind of uh, linear-ish trend there with some scatter around it. Um, when you go and apply, or this is actually a random forest here in the blue blue dots here to the uh, available um, jobs, um, what you find is that when you fall outside of the area where the green dots cover, it just kind of goes to crap. It doesn't do well. It, it, there's, it, it just kind of creates this vertical line. It doesn't match any trend. And that's really a symptom of the, the bias and the overfitting, that kind of stuff. Um, so the synthetic model that I generated created this this red cloud here uh, on the predictions for the same data. Um, and it's interesting, it, it maintains the trend, but it's kind of off. Like it's not on the, 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 the dotted line is the perfect model trend on all these plots. And so you can see the, the red dots honored the, the trend of the data, but didn't quite match up with the, the real data's trend. And so um, this led me to say, well, the model must be getting something right because it's got the same trend as the real data, but it's just not conditioned, like something is off with it. And so I, I then embark, and th this is a common thing with transfer learning problems with images too. You, you usually pull off like a couple of layers of the network and try to condition it that way. Um, so I tried doing that, just pulling off some layers and conditioning it, and it overfit immediately. So, um, and so what I discovered was is that you have to use a very, 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 very weak model to condition. Because <laughs> otherwise it will, it will overfit immediately on the, on the data set, even if with very few features. So um, on the right here, I'm, I've got to hurry here because I, I know you probably have questions. Um, so on the right here is what happened after conditioning uh, on the, uh, the model. So you can see it kind of brings it up on, uh, for this feature on the trend with the real data. Um, this residual plot is very interesting. I won't spend a lot of time on it. We can discuss it later if you want to grab me. Uh, it shows there's still some problems because the, there's a trend in the residuals, uh, and that probably has to do with the input features. And after I got this approved, I did make some progress on this and get this flattened out a bit, but uh, I, they don't like me to change the slides after they approve it. So, uh, But the good news is the residuals are fairly normal looking, um, which is really helpful if you want to do like a Monte Carlo or something. So this is this is actually our um, this is actually a lot of different fields for the last two years. This is the jobs we actually did, um, and this is showing the prediction versus the actual. And, and what we found was is that we were beating human performance by about 10 percent. Uh, so we had like a planning data set. This is what they thought it would do. This is what we the model thought it would do. We beat it, we beat, beat it by about 10 percent. But what was really interesting was is when you did one of these like scorpion tail plots with like the capital allocation piece, which I can't show, but um, the, the model was doing a very, very good job of placing the job in the right quartile. And so when you go to rank jobs in the future, um, it would allow you to go to the, the bottom quartile in the model and substitute something from the upper quartile. And, and you, you could actually improve the, the economics of your overall program that way. So. So it, it is actually practical. This, this did actually roll into a pipeline that you could deploy broadly over the company, um, as long as it had some fundamental data available. Um, so here's some potential improvements. Uh, I'll, I'll put that up there. I'll leave this up here for you to read. Um, this type of mindset of you know, going in and debiasing your data, you know, filling in stuff, I could see it being applicable in a lot of different areas, especially areas where we feel like we're really data starved uh, or data is really expensive to collect. Um, and, and I would definitely encourage, you know, thinking simple in terms of the physics model or whatever you're using to underlie it. Because what's really great about this Darcy function is that when you go to generate the data, you can generate millions of wells in a fairly short amount of time, really, really big, robust data sets. 
And basically the trick is to go to the statistics of your real data and make sure that that uncertainty is represented in the, in the, in the, the, the artificial data. It's, it's kind of a little bit Bayesian in mindset, but it, it, it was working. And in some cases, it, you know, it wasn't reliable enough for a pipeline. In some cases, the synthetic data was actually competitive with a supervised model without conditioning in a, in a few fields that I saw. So um, it, it, but it all goes back to kind of honoring those statistics around the, the, the uncertainty of your data, right? So I'll, I'll take questions. Um, thank you to, to the Peter and, and the sponsors of the conference here and all the folks at California Resources that helped me out here. I did post uh, some critical pieces of this study to a open GitHub repository. Um, the data, the synthetic data generator is there, so you can go and try generating some wells. And, um, and you could also, if you, if you manage to generate the, a similar feature table, even run it on one of your fields if you wanted. But, uh, and then I also provided some real data that I, that I showed here in this slides. Uh, I had to clean out some identifying stuff for the, the lawyers, but uh, it's real data and you can actually kind of see for yourself how it's performing and what, ha what went into it. So thank you. showed the, these uh, cases. Uh, coming from the statistical world, uh, people in statistics will call that the prior, the likelihood of the posterior. And what you showed from the machine learning uh, was very cl uh, classical. So maybe could you expand a little bit on this play? Because, yeah, this yes. is the so, Especially the, the bias term in the era, which people in Bayesian statistics would, would refer as to the model error. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So um, I, you know, this was definitely, the idea behind this was definitely informed by the big ideas of Bayesian statistics. So I will say that it, in the way I work is a little more um, like applied. So you, uh, you notice I didn't put any giant Bayesian equations on there like sometimes you do. But the idea here is that the synthetic model is your prior if you're, if you're thinking in that term, in those terms. And in that prior, to make it effective right out of the box, you, you take your, your statistics from your, your real data's features and you apply that to the artificial data. And then if you really want to get fancy, there's actually some algorithms in Bayesianism that could condition those for you. Um, I haven't applied those yet, but I, I'm looking into like PyMC to do some like uh, Markov chain type stuff. Um, I, I, there's a little bit of pressure working in a company to just, you know, because we have something that's pretty effective at, at allocating capital to just kind of get it out there. But there is a lot of room for improvement. There's a lot of room for collaboration. So I would encourage you to go into the GitHub and make comments. I, I, I kind of did a dump in there. So uh, there's still a lot of work to do on like commenting stuff and, and directing people. But, you know, definitely go in there, make issues, ask questions, talk to me after the, you know, 